How's it going my WBE people, Dr. Slacking the Slacking Doctor back with the week 7 weekly recap for the SHIELD division and unfortunately once again this week I'm kicking it off on my own. My co-host Jacob as always will be picking up for the second half of the weekly recap but sadly we weren't able to record again together this week. We do think this is the final week that this will be the case so hopefully from next week onwards we will be together for the rest of the season which we're both really looking forward to and hopefully you guys are too. Our apologies for this, it's just work schedules, time zones and everything else is very difficult to work around. However. We have a fantastic group of games to work through today, so without wasting any of your time, I want to kick us off with the Battle of the Week this week. And the Battle of the Week saw two of the heavyweights in the Shield Division going head-to-head -head, uh, with Under the Radar Kelly taking on MV, uh, with the Maryland Tour Terrapins going up against the San Diego Chim Chargers. And this was a really, really interesting match on paper. Both coaches, I believe, with only one loss going into this week. Two of the kind of titans in this division expecting to come in sort of the top spot in this division, vying out for that top seed. Uh, going head to head with Envy emerging the 1-0 victor in what was a very, very close and very entertaining game. It was marred somewhat by a ton of RNG on both sides. Kelly getting the better of the RNG in the early game, a couple of crits here and there, a burn as well in the zoom rule. Uh, and Envy getting the better of the RNG in the late game as Kelly managed to miss a crucial stone edge that would have won him the match. However, there was some good plays to be found amongst all of this RNG, and there's some stuff definitely worth talking about. Uh, I felt like uh, Kelly played really well in the early game, keeping his offensive momentum up, and especially as we got to the mid to late game, he made some really aggressive doubles with his Darmanitan that, as you can see from Envy's uh, six that he decided to bring, Darmanitan really, really was an issue for him, especially after Dugtrio went down to chip down the Zygarde. Uh, things like Azumarill and Victini are not the best fire resist. They still take sort of 40 to 50% from Darmanitan, which just hits like a truck. So, uh, yeah, Kelly played really, really well, being able to bring that thing in multiple times on aggressive doubles, staying in on a Scarf Victini, predicting MV to U-turn, and knowing that even if he got the prediction wrong and MV locked into Bolt Strike or something similar, he would be able to then bring in a Zygarde and claim a kill that way. So, Kelly just used his offensive mods really, really well in the mid to late game, keeping up the pressure, like I say, but it was ultimately a double by MV that really decided the game, as in the late game, when Kelly just had his Scyther, his Zygarde, and his Milotic left, it looked like Zygarde would be able to clean up Z Stone Edge being able to kill Togekiss and then Thousand Arrows or E-Speed easily being able to pick off the weakened Victini that was very very low. But Envy after bringing out his Togekiss on the Zygarde doubled into Victini scouting for the Z move forcing Envy to burn the 100% accurate Z move and giving him a fighting shot as then uh, Kelly was relying on landing his Stone Edges on the Togekiss in the late game and was relying on not getting his um, Milotic flinched in the very very late game when it came down to just Milotic versus Togekiss. Kiss. It was a really, really tight game, like I say, but that play from Envy was a fantastic play, scouting for the Z, and it really did just clutch him out of the game, and it can't be not at all. I did think Kelly maybe had some better options in the late game, and I think after he'd played so well, after he had really been on his toes all game, making the aggressive doubles, making all the aggressive reads, I think after all of that, when he got to the end game and he realized, okay, all I have to do here is click the Z move into E speed and I win. I think he kind of took his eye off the ball a little bit because I think had he Thousand Arrows there the first turn, killing the, the Victini that came in, even if Togekiss roosted, he could have then Z'd the next turn knowing that MV was planning to stay in on his Zygarde. Or if, it, uh, if MV had gone for the Air Slash and killed his Zygarde, he would have been able to go out into the Scyther and kill the Togekiss, which would have been very low after the Thousand Arrows. Uh, and then the Victini wasn't able to scarf into any one move that could beat the Scyther and the Milotic, as Scyther didn't drop to the Bolt Strike, and uh, Milotic didn't drop to the V Create, of course. So I do think that Kelly had kind of another play that he could have made, but there's nothing to say that MV wouldn't have roosted once, I suppose, and then gone into Victini scouting for the Z the second time, but that would have been... Uh, an incredible call that I don't think many people make. But yeah, I, I felt like Kelly maybe had a slightly safer route he could have taken, but I can understand fully why in the very end game when he has just played his heart out, he kind of just made an obvious play um, that I think most of us would have made and Envy just being that caliber of player scouted for it and called it perfectly to win himself the match. Still unfortunate by Kelly missing the stone edges, but that's the way it goes with a move like that. It's very hard to consistently land several in a row when your opponent is just roosting up on you. Uh, moving on from that game to probably the shock of the week, as Tup emerged the 5-0 victor against Cybertron. The Pittsburgh Raptors, I believe, picking up their first win of the season, unless I'm mistaken, against the Melbourne Rotoms. This was uh, a really, really surprising result, but a very deserved one on Tup's side. He brought a fantastic Miss Magia set with a sub, nasty plot, hidden power fighting, and a shadow ball, being able to hit all of uh, 
uh, Cybertron's team very, very effectively. Unfortunately, Tup hasn't, uh, at the time of recording this, uploaded his side of the game yet, so I'm not exactly sure uh, of the exact spreads or what was going into all of his sets here. Uh, but from what we did see, his prep seemed really on point. Specs wrote on Wash, uh, was able with just Volt Switch and Hydro Pump to apply a ton of pressure to Cybertron's team, and Harry Armour came in as well to claim two kills for itself in this match. I felt like uh, the real deciding point of this game was actually turn one, where Tup made the incredibly aggressive play, clicking Specs Volt Switch on a lead Mamoswine, uh, when Mamoswine could easily have been sashed, which it was as it happens, uh, and could easily have been running freeze dry to hit this thing. Uh, I thought it was an incredibly brave play, not one I ever would have made personally, but I couldn't believe how well it worked out for him, as uh, Cybertron did pivot out into Conkelder, taking I think over 50% from the Volt Switch and really chunking down one of the major threats to Tup's team. Definitely got that play 100% right, and I was super, super impressed with that. Uh, I think that switch there was kind of evident of how this game went for Cybertron as he switched out of the Mamoswine on the Volt Switch. Uh, it didn't look like he was really comfortable with his prep, it didn't look like he was really in tune with the build, uh, and he did mention at the start of the video that this was the first week he'd used his new uh, front office to build his team for him as he had been really unavailable this week and was having to use a team that he hadn't built for himself. Uh, I've done that myself sometimes and it can be incredibly difficult to adapt to a build that somebody else has put together if you don't quite know how things work exactly. Uh, I know for example he forgot that the Miller tank had Scrappy to be able to hit the Miss Magius first and took Needless Chip on the Aroma before eventually going into his mill tank and it was just one of those games where I think it can happen when you're super busy and you get caught out uh, by someone with fantastic prep and you're not quite comfortable with yours. I don't think Cybertron will take too much away from this other than, you know, hopefully next week he can bounce back and put in another good performance, but I don't think he did too much wrong. It just looked like he was in an uncomfortable position and, and once he lost that early momentum, he was really on the back foot for the rest of the game. He made some super aggressive plays like leaving, leaving his Mega Slowbro in against Specs Rotom, predicting the Hydro Pump, and Swords Dancing on a Harry Armor, predicting him to switch out. Both those plays cost him the Mons uh, Katana dropping to Hariyama and Mega Slowbro of course dropping to Rotom Wash but I understood why he made them I think once he lost the early momentum once he really found himself in the back because of that brilliant Miss Magius build uh, I think at that point he had to start making plays I think he had to go off top kind of making choke plays switching out his Hariyama things like that Timid Kartana although a very viable set is not fantastically as strong as normal Kartana, especially when you're trying to break through a Charizard X. So I can understand why he felt he needed the SD boost to be able to break through Tup's team. Uh, it was just one of those things where when you're in the back, you have to start making aggressive plays and you might lose differential, but it's better to try and win the game and, and not worry about differential, I suppose. And I think that's why it emerged as such a big victory for Tup here, but he definitely deserved it. Like I say, I thought his prep was fantastic this week, probably the best I've seen from him all season. And it was really, really nice to see him pick up a W. Moving on from that game, we have another game which I wouldn't exactly call as a shock, but certainly seeing the Durham Dredigans lose another game this week against the Crystal City Blazikens was a bit of a surprise. Leo is one of the most established coaches in this league for sure, uh, and has been impressive this season. He's put together some good wins. He has a very, very intimidating draft too. So, uh, But Game Boy Luke has been no slouch, and it showed through again here. I thought that from very early on, Game Boy Luke just took control of this game. He really looked like he was in the driving seat the whole match. Uh, I actually felt like although the Mega Lopen, he got two kills here for Leo, it kind of lost a lot of momentum with just clicking uh, Fake Out a, a few times and really not getting much damage off on anything when it was doing so. I think the Mega Scissor pivoted in on it uh, and possibly the Necrozma too. And, and the Fake Out really wasn't doing much. Um, I think once Leo found himself in the back, maybe playing a bit more aggressively, just going for those high jump kicks, going for those fire punches, uh, might have been able to sort of swing the, the momentum back in his favour. But instead, I felt like he was relatively passive for the early part of the game. I also think one play that I can understand uh, why he made it, but was a bit of a misplay, was when he exploded with his Steelix uh, on the Scrafty. I understand that he was just looking like he was going to go down to Scrafty, essentially, and that was his way of getting off some big damage on it. However, losing Steelix that early uh, was, was really, really detrimental to this game, because Togedomaru, Scarf Togedomaru with Zing Zap, absolutely ripped Leo's team apart after his ground type went down, and I can fully understand why from Leo's perspective, you don't really fear Scarf Togedomaru. It's not a mon that you often see topping MVP rankings uh, in any weeks of any season but this week it did pick up four kills uh getting a nice flinch off on the dragonite as well as a shut down that and just picking off a bunch of mons on leo's team uh, i thought that luke positioned it really really well happily taking the steelix from leo and then bringing it in at the right moment to use it sturdy uh and yeah just really abused the zingzap perfectly uh, the flinch on the Dragonite I do think is worth discussing because had Leo been able to get two Dragon Dancers off that would have been terrifying for Luke's team. 
However, I think if you're relying on getting two Dragon Dancers off against a 30% flinch chance move twice in a row, uh, you definitely know you're taking those risks, right? If you're switching on two Skulls, you're kind of expecting to get burned, and it's the same sort of odds here. So, whilst I do understand that Leo has a reason to feel aggrieved with the flinch from Togedemaru, and Luke has a reason to feel like he got a little bit fortuitous there, uh, I think it was a, a, a risk that Leo was forced into taking because of his early game positioning, and that really he would never want to take uh, in an ideal scenario. So, these things kind of happen in Pokemon. Other than that, um, I thought that Luke used all of his mons really, really well, keeping his Necrozma around to be able to take on the Megalopony and things like that. Uh, his pre-marina in the end game being able to pick off the Manaphy for the final kill, somehow living the energy ball after Manaphy had tail glowed up. Uh, but even if he hadn't been able to take that, the Manaphy had revealed to be a super berry and the Landorus out speeding it would have been able to pick it up at the very end. So he looked very comfortable in this game. I thought Luke played excellently and it was really, really impressive to see him now go with back-to-back -back wins, I believe. Uh, definitely putting a get together a good run of form right now. Now moving on to our final game, we have Patty Trills and Galactic Elliot as the Chicago Cub Juice take on the Sin City Scissors. Uh, and this was another really interesting game because Patty for me has absolutely been the surprise package of this season. At the start, I didn't know too much about him. I didn't know how he was going to fare. He had a really tough week one against Gator where it looked like, you know, Gator's draft wasn't cut, quite cut out to handle Hazard Stack plus Megazam. But it turns out no draft is cut out to take Hazard Stack plus Megazam. It's really been doing work for him this season and he's been playing it very, very well. I think again, his build this week uh, was was very very effective and it was tough for Elliot to take back-to-back -back L's if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, he had a really bright start this season though so I'm sure he will bounce back but it's definitely been a little bit of a tough run for him. Uh, there was a very slow early game here with both players just really vying to get their hazards up and try and keep hazards off their side of the field. Uh, the only real thing of note that happened in the early game was the Mega Garchomp missing the Fire Blast on the Rabombi. The reason I bring this up uh, it's just because I felt like it really lost Elliot a bunch of momentum. He then had to pivot into the Mantine to try and defog on the Sticky Webs. He uh, was really hurt by the Rabombi later in the game as it managed to pick up two KOs. And I think that Fire Blast uh, landing, although it may not have KO'd the Rabombi, would have really helped him out positioning wise. It might have been able to make him play a little less passively. And I think that was what really cost him this game is that we've seen at his best with things like Hooper and Bound this season. Uh, him just really ripped teams apart with his offense. But this week it felt like a much more passive team. The home clause Sand Slash being unable to break through a burnt Ferrothorn, actually getting 1v1 by the burnt Ferrothorn, which was definitely tough to watch. Um, I think I missed out a KO actually looking at these stats. I think Ferrothorn is supposed to have a KO there as well. So that's my mistake. Uh, but yeah, it was just really, really tough for. Elliot's team to, to break through Patty's team this week um, and I think that perhaps his hazard removal he, he maybe made the wrong choice here because uh, Mantine isn't a defogger that can easily come in and beat Ferrothorn 1v1 with toxic leech seed it gets worn down so fast by Ferrothorn uh, I thought that maybe something like the Serena could have come as a rapid spin set this week, being able to spin on the Ferrothorn, perhaps if you'd run protective pads, something like that, to protect from Iron Barbs, but really threatening it with a high jump kick, crucially forcing it out all the time as it spins away those hazards, and that might have been a more effective way for Elliot to keep hazards off his side of the field, with things like Chandelure and the Alolan Ninetales and Mantine all being weak to rocks, and the Alolan Ninetales in particular being crucial to keeping his hail up for his Sand Slash. Uh, he did bring Veil again this week, but it didn't really work that well this week. I didn't feel like he had a lot of setup to abuse behind the Veil. Uh, and it just felt like, I say, like uh, a lot of passive turns for him, which was super unfortunate. But I can understand that these weeks happen, and it was it was definitely a tough one for him, a tough matchup. Patty has been so good this season, and his draft is so, so scary that uh, I think every coach will struggle with it when they come up against it. So... They are all the games I have to cover for you here. Uh, my co-host Jacob, as always, has three other fantastic games to talk about. So without wasting any of your time, I will pass over to him. Hello, WB fans. My name is Jacob, as always, taking over for my co-host, the Dr. Slacking, a.k.a. Matt. Good dude. He did a good job on his end. Uh, thank you very much for getting me your footage. And now I just want to address a couple things. I really appreciate everyone's feedback. Uh, last week in the video for the recap video uh, makes me a better analyst by saying you guys want to hear both sides and I understand that I just wanted to address that it's really difficult watching both sides both perspectives getting note of every single like move set that they bring because some people don't do team builders so it's hard for me to sit through the video and like see every single set so I don't know their exact EVs or any of that stuff. So I just wanted to address that. I'm doing the best I can and Matt's doing the best he can. We're going to do the best we can and that'll be that. So without further ado, let's get started with the first game on my side. We're going to be talking about Kylie and the Miami Don fan taking on its Gator and the Florida Gators. 
Very, very fun game. One of the Game of the Week candidates, but uh, we ultimately gave it to Envy and Kelly. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was a fun, fun game to watch. Um, I believe it came down to Gator winning 1-0 with Kangaskhan clutched it at the end. Oh my gosh, like, I've never seen, like, like you would think, you know, Meg Kangaskhan, really, really good mon in format. Like, honestly, Meg Kangaskhan should be allowed in every single draft league, but it's not broken at all. It, it's... Uh, it's a good mod, but it's not it, it's not amazing mod. There's a lot of mods I would rather have than Meg Kang's gun. But anyway, um, Kyle A brought a cool team. Uh, he brought Refresh Mega Pidgeot. Like, wow. Like, he, he got poisoned against Celebi. Celebi ran Call Mine. Like, it's like Gator's thing to do to bring Call Mine toxic mods, like, at least once a week. Like, I feel like he's just purposely doing that at this point. <laughs> just because he's like, I gotta bring it again. Maybe that's not his thought mindset at all. But, either way, it's working pretty well. Uh, he did have the refresh on Mega Pidgeot. Um, but, turning point of the match, I guess, was like, that kind of put it into Kyle's favor a little bit. Was uh, getting crit on the Zorora on Hurricane. That was kind of huge. Because Zero would have been more at like 60 five-ish percent if he didn't get crit I, I believe something like that but either way though it, it was it was all right um it worked out for gator like he just had to clutch it um there was like a really crazy i haven't watched this game in a few days but there's a really crazy was, was victory belt a really annoying man or was no 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 is critra i believe yeah he brought critra and he basically had to poison it, right? And he had to get fake out pressure with Kangaskhan in order to beat it. And the Kritra set with Agility, Focus Energy, Draco, and was it Hydro or Surf? I don't remember. But it, like, basically really, really marked Gator's team. And, like, that was a pivotal point in the match where he got the Kingdra set up with... The, I don't think he clicked Agility, but I think he clicked Focus Energy still. And that was incredibly dangerous. Like, oof. Like, and Gator knew it was coming. Like, it was, like, hard to prep for. Like, that's a set that sometimes you just don't have counterplay to. <clears throat> and, like, it is what it is. Like, I mean, like, that set's incredible, like, if you can get it, pull it off. But, um, yeah, it really helped, um, especially with, like, light screen, um, support. Um, well, no, that actually, the light screen didn't matter. The light screen was on Gator's end, I think, by Pukumuku. But, um, that was just crazy i don't know it's just a fun game like you get to see mods that like kangaskhan that aren't really used in draft format ever like normal kangaskhan isn't used that often but honestly it's like pretty underrated because you get to you run wish protect seismic toss like fake out it gets scrap it gets really good abilities and scrap like or really good ability and scrappy so you can literally spam seismic toss against every single team you could bring seismic toss toxic wish protect like every single matchup if you really wanted to do that and, like, yeah, it's just insane, actually. Uh, but, yeah, <laughs> that was a fun match to watch between two really fun dudes. Um, but, yeah, let's move on to the next match where we're going to be talking about the Uzi Gunner and the Bullet Punch Club facing Christian, a.k.a. Faint Attacks, in the Atlanta Umbreons. Now, Uzi is just on another level, and he's just joined the WB. I know he's, like, really excited to be a part of the WBE, so I definitely do not blame him in the slightest for being excited. Um, but, yeah, like, he's just playing and prepping super well. Just the sets he's bringing, he's bringing, like, everything that he needs. Like, Assault Vest Kiram to live a hit from Mega Gardevoir. I believe he's at after Stealth Rock and retaliate with Iron Head and bops it. Like, that's just insane to me. Like, literally crazy. And, like, the fact he ran a hasty nature because he didn't need to take defensive hits. He only needed to take a specially defense or special hits. So, like, or physically, physical hits, I should say. But, like, and then he brought, like, just a bulky Mega Arrow with Fire Blast for the Fortress. He, like, and I think early on, he, like, eliminated the Fortress, like, super early um, with his Like, he led Kiram for the second straight week, and it just, like, bodies everything. Like, it's so bulky and so good and i think uh, christian brought a specs lantern this week if i if i, I want to say that but yeah uh, uzi was like in prime position this entire game like uzi was reading him i th he brought uh dual status arcanine right with toxic and willow did i see that right yeah no he did yeah he did he brought toxic willow morning sun flamethrower like that's just such a brutal set to deal with and he brought Chartyberry specifically for the Durant. Like, he just, he prepped basically perfectly. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like, he pretty much prepped so good. Like, not today, like, in Christian, like, 
made it as close as he did, like, it, I mean, that's, like, it was a tough matchup for Christian, like, especially, like, someone against Uzi Gunner, because Uzi is so well-versed in draft format, and, like, when you, when you fa face a good, like, the, the, the skill gap between just people in general, I'm not, I don't want to go about this like this, but Uzi is really, really good. I've known Uzi for a long, long time, and, when you get someone who is really well versed in draft format, who is against a more inexperienced foe, like that person has so much advantage in that game, so it, it's hard to not see what Uzi's doing and like just want to credit him all the way. But Christian played to the best of his ability and played pretty well for what he was given. And I find it funny how <laughs> Christian and Leo swapped Dragonite and Durant for our, what was it? What did Leo get in return? I don't remember fully, but. Did he get fly again? I don't remember. But they swapped those two. So Leo used Dragonite this week. And so did Christian. Because Leo had to play Luke earlier than Christian had to play Uzi. And it was just funny. It was just funny how that worked. And when I saw that, I was like really confused. And I didn't realize they had to fa face off earlier than they did. But Luke was in Atlanta visiting his friends. <laughs> just funny. That's all I want to say about that. But yeah. It was a fun game. Uzi definitely deserved the win. Like, um... Yeah, it's just tough to combat that, honestly. Like, I don't know. I need to take better notes. That's all I'm going to say. And next week it'll be better because this week was busy for me. Uh, I'm going to part-time at my job now. So I will have a lot more time to commit to this and write better notes and have more time for this because I'm not doing 18,000 things in a week. But anyway, uh, let's talk about the last game of the week that I want to talk about. And that is Mewtwo Fanate versus Jodor. Um, honestly, uh, Jodor has been impressing me the last few weeks. He, since he made his transaction, he's actually 3-0. and He's beaten Mewtwo Fanate, Patty Trails, and who was the last person he beat uh, to, for the three-game win streak? I honestly can't remember, but Jodor has been playing super well. Um, this week was no different. Uh, Nate, I know, did not have the most time to prep in the world, but honestly, um, the fact that Nate brought it down to a 1-0 when he didn't have the most time to prep is really cool because, um, yeah, like, if he would have just made a few different plays of that match, like, that would have been cool. But, like, honestly, that you can say the same for Joder. Um, uh, I'm kind of upset that I didn't get to see any prep for on Nate's side, which I understand, like, he was pretty busy and he, he had his family over and stuff. So I understand with, that he didn't get a chance to show that his side of the team. But um, Joder brought from some fun stuff. Um, Joder brought, okay, I'm trying to see Joder's team really quick right here. Uh, he brought Expert Belt, uh, Rocks, Bisharp. He brought some, he brought like just super physically defensive Me Mega Venusaur, which makes sense. Um, cause it kind of walled most of <laughs> Nate's team. Uh, and he brought physically defensive Avalog and he brought specially defensive, um, what is it? Uh, Umbreon, like, he brought, like, pretty standard spreads, not standard sets, but standard spreads, um, so that was fine, but, like, he brought the correct team, like, I, I think, mo for the most part, against Nate, like, he brought Scarfed Ape again, like, I know people love Scarf Ape, but Z-Move Ape, and especially in a format like WB, where you can basically run Z-Move on anything, you know, I would be taking full advantage of that if I were some, like, uh, if I were, like, all the coaches, because, Honestly, in Freezy, literally crazy. Like, I don't know. Like, Freezy is just... We don't have to deal with Z-Moves in Sword and Shield. But, anyway, um, there is a lot to take out of this game. Like, I think both coaches played all right. They played pretty decently for the most part. Like, there's some hiccups on both sides. I mean, uh, Nate, I know, was busy, so it was hard to win the game and prep accordingly the way that you wanted to um but yeah <laughs> that'll do it like i i'm really busy so i'm sorry that this is kind of lackluster this week and i don't want it to be but next week dr slack and i will be back together we're gonna do better we're gonna bounce off each other so i hope you guys can understand why this is a little bit shaky this week it's just life been crazy so and i haven't got a lot of sleep so Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great day. We'll see you guys next week, and peace.